So last night I was booked to play a party. We got to the show about 11.15. Around 11.30, I was standing behind the stage talking with somebody, and I noticed a helicopter coming over the mountains. And it kind of dipped lower and lower and starts shining its lights on the crowd. And as I looked back towards the crowd, I saw this guy all in camouflage and walking by with an assault rifle. And a few of these troops rushed the stage and cut the sound off and started yelling. And no one resisted. They had, they had police dogs raiding this crowd of people. And the next thing you know, there's a can of tear gas thrown into the crowd. And one of the promoter's friends, a really small female, she was attacked by one of the dogs, one of the police dogs. And she, she struggles to try to get away from this dog. And the police take her down. And three grown men proceed to kick her in the stomach. This, this event was 100% legal. They had every permit the city told them that they needed, and they had licensed security guards. It's one of the scariest things I've ever witnessed in person. Was it really necessary to send in an army? My boyfriend Shane was diagnosed with renal cell cancer. Within three days of his diagnosis, they took him in for an operation to remove his right kidney, only to discover that the cancer had spread to his lungs. A month after his surgery, they began the chemotherapy. The chemo was hell, and Shane spent one week of every month in this hell for a whole year. During the final month of the chemotherapy, Shane's oncologist decided that it wasn't helping and gave him the option to stop. During this whole time, we didn't discuss the cancer. It was only brought up once. When he came home from a checkup and it was brought up that the nodules in his lung had grown, I broke down. I had been introduced to MDMA by a friend. He'd given me some literature on um, using it in psychotherapy within stage cancer patients. My entire relationship with Shane revolved around this awful stress. I was desperate. We took the recommended dose and waited. When the drug started to affect us, we felt closer than we had in a long time. I began to cry when I looked at him, and he knew what was on my mind. He said he was not afraid to die. He was raised not to fear death. But knowing that his death would have an impact on me, well, that, that really scared him. I started to realize that nothing that we did was going to change the fact that he was going to die from cancer. My telling him that I wanted him to live and be with me forever would encourage him to go through the chemo, just for me. He would look at me and caress my face, assuring me that he will always be inside of me and looking over me. This was a really hard time for us, and there was nothing that would make it easy, but serenity was ours if we worked together. I got juvenile rheumatoid arthritis at about the age of 14 and a half. Um, essentially, my immune system is attacking the cartilage in my body and treating it like a virus. Medicinal cannabis has made the arthritis burn out. I was physically very active and very strong, and it was essentially like nature just stuck her foot out and tripped me and I landed on my face. I mean, it. I went from going and doing constantly to having to have help to get out of bed, having to have somebody feed me, wipe me, you know, everything. This hand is the one that's been fixed with the rubber knuckles and they work. The extensor muscles in my arm that pull my fingers open um, are still atrophied and I'm working on getting those back through physical therapy. But the ones that close my hand work very well. They're very strong. <laughs> wow. 
So um, I have one hand that gets more and more functional all the time, and one hand that is the way both hands used to be. I've had three surgeries on my left hand. I have a plate with eight screws in my left wrist, a screw in my left thumb, um, a screw in my middle finger, and two pins in my ring finger besides rubber knuckles. And the only reason um, that they've been able to do the surgeries on me is because the arthritis is no longer burning me up. I, I can do and go. I have hobbies. I, before cannabis, I didn't do anything. I didn't go anywhere. I sat around and watched TV because as long as I'm perfectly still, I don't hurt. As soon as I tried to move, it would hurt. So mostly I sat around and watched TV. I have seen Parkinson's patients stop shaking. I've seen hepatitis and AIDS patients gain weight and have healthy liver counts. I have seen arthritis patients, myself included, get up and go. Um, we had a girl that was in the program that was in a wheelchair who um, at the time that she joined up, couldn't open her eyes on her own. They had to blow the smoke into her lungs. She was getting up out of her wheelchair and walking for short periods of time. That is a miracle. I'm motivated. Um, because I think these things have really important fundamental therapeutic utility that no other substances come close to. And if we're right, it's going to help people. And if it's used in a ritualized context, in a safe context, it, you might be able to look at the therapeutic utility. And so if we can show that this is a critical need that's vital in all of our lives, in our society today, it's not about some blast to the past. Um, um, even even the harshest voices are, are going to have to listen to their own hearts. What we're trying to make the point to the culture is that focused rites of passage, which are used in native cultures and other cultures that have successfully integrated psychedelics, are in fact the antidote to drug abuse rather than the doorway to drug abuse. Um, many drugs are highly toxic, but they can be life-saving as well. And so if you can frame the question reasonably enough for the right populations and show that it's helpful for them, nobody, not even uh, a gun to token um, drug warrior, is going to want to stop therapeutic um, medicine to the people that need it.